All right, uh, before we get started, do you have any questions about the, the skip list assignment? I know there's one question posted on Piazza, we have to look into it. We think there's a bug in the BW tree, but that shouldn't affect how the test is correct, the BW tree is incorrect. So we'll, we'll fix that, but that shouldn't affect how your, uh, your skip list goes. Are there any questions, high level questions about the skip list? Everyone has started. Who hasn't started? Who wants to admit they haven't started? Dana, have you started? She hasn't started, okay. Uh, all right, so for today's class, you know, the last, the last lecture was all about how are we gonna store the, uh, the values of our tuples and organize them in, 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 in memory. So now what we're gonna talk about today is sort of a layer below that, sort of independent of whether we're using the NSM or DSM storage format. Now we're gonna say how do we actually compress uh, the data. Um, so we'll start off some background uh, about compression. And again, everyone should pretty much understand the basics of how data compression works, right, from your undergrad and CS or intro courses. And so what I'm gonna be talking about is sort of what do we have to be mindful of about when we wanna do compression inside of a database system? Like why is this different than just, you know, gzipping or zipping files on, on, your, on your desktop? And then we'll talk about how to do naive compression, uh, which when we'll see all the problems you can have with this, and then we'll finish off talking about uh, going to more detail how to do columnar compression, because uh, this is where you're gonna get most of the benefit, this is where you're gonna see compression the most in OLAP systems. And then we'll finish off talking about uh, research that we've done here at CMU on how to compress all to be indexes, because we'll see that we'll end up storing the raw data in our column stores, but we don't actually wanna do that in a, uh, in a row store if you're doing transactions, because compression is gonna be too slow. So we can see how we can compress indexes instead. So uh, we've talked about this in the very beginning uh, when, we, when we sort of motivated why we want to study in-memory database systems. And we said that in, in these, you know, the legacy systems or traditional systems that assume the primary storage location of the database is uh, on a disk, whether it's an SSD or an HDD, then I.O. is always going to be the main bottleneck. So in, in, these, in this world, compression totally makes sense because now for, you know, you, now when you ever you read a page from disk and bring it to your buffer pool, you're essentially bringing in more data than you would under, otherwise if it was uncompressed, right? And so in, in these systems, or in a disk-based system, the disk is so slow that the database system is absolutely willing to pay the, 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 the trade-off of having to spend more CPU cycles to decompress and compress the data, right? But it's not as, as clear that this is always what we want to do in an in-memory database system because it's more complicated now because now the cost of going fetching a, a tuple is, is significantly faster than it was before in a disk-based system. So we need to be careful about what kind of compression algorithm we use and the techniques we're going to use to do in-memory database compression because we don't want it to be the case that yes, we're going to be able to store more data uh, in DRAM, but now our system is going to be super slow because we're spending all our time you know, unzipping or, or, or rezipping our data. So it goes without saying that compressing a database in DRAM is important and we want to do this because it's going to allow us to store more data. But again, we have to be mindful of this trade-off of making sure that we don't, uh, in exchange for having a better compression ratio, we don't reduce the speed of our system. And in general, is, I, I can't prove this, but whenever I look at the literature and understand what systems actually do, in-memory database systems are always going to choose speed over compression, right? Because if you, if you just have a slow compression algorithm, then you're going to lose all the benefits of, of an in-memory database system. So just to say also real quick too, the, 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 the reason why you want to compress an in-memory database is sort of obvious, right? Because DRAM is expensive, the capacity is limited, and uh, so we want to have, you know, by compressing the data, we'll have a larger database and more data with possibly fewer machines and fewer amount of, few, fewer, bleh, less DRAM. So like DRAM is actually really expensive, not only to buy, but also to like maintain inside your server. So there's been studies that said like, for, the, for the, all the energy you have to use to power a machine, 40% of it is being spent on DRAM, just refreshing it. So again, this is why we wanna, we wanna you know, use compression to avoid that. So we wanna talk a little bit about what, uh, what real databases look like, and we'll be able to see how we can exploit their characteristics to get better compression. Right? We, want, we want to understand why is compression going to work in, in a real database. So there's two key characteristics we, we want to be mindful of. The first is that real data is very, very skewed. 
meaning the distribution of the values for individual attributes are going to be highly, highly skewed. Right? And so the example people always use is something like the Ziffian distribution from the Brown corpus. So if you don't know what the Ziffian distribution is, essentially the power law, right, sort of exponential uh, growth. And then the Brown corpus was this thing that they, uh, it, was a, it was a collection of, of texts, of, of, of American, American English literature that these researchers generated at the Brown University. And then somebody came along and counted the number of words, how, how often each word was used. And they found that the most often used word is, is obviously the word the, right? And then the next most often word, used word was occurred half the amount of time as the previous one. So the next one occurred half as many times as the word the. And then likewise, the third one occurred half as much as the second one, and so forth. So you have this sort of exponential curve. So you, you're going to see Ziffian distributions or parallel distributions all the time in real, real world databases. Right? Think of like on Reddit. Right? There is a very small number of people that post a lot of the articles that get upvoted. Right? Or there's a small number of people that post most of the comments. Right? So you have this huge uh, parallel curve where you have a, a small number of people posting all the material and then there's a long tail where you have people not posting anything. Right? That's a Ziffian distribution. So we can ex try to exploit that fact when we do uh, compression. The other aspect we can do is, or aspect we can exploit is uh, real databases have a lot of correlated columns, correlated attributes. So what I mean by that is, say you have a uh, table that, that keeps track of people's addresses. Uh, so if you have somebody's uh, zip code, then you can easily derive what their state or city, city is. Right? So these values are always correlated. Or likewise, in, if you go for a temporal dimension, like on Amazon, the date in which somebody ordered something will occur uh, just a few days before when something was shipped. Right? So you, you know, Amazon usually ships something within seven days, so those dates are going to be really close to each other. So we can try to exploit that when, when we do compression. So then again, this is, this is, you're going to see this time and time again. If you look at all the different applications, you're going to see uh, the, the, these two properties. So now, to do database compression, there's two goals we're going to try to want to achieve. The first one is that we want to ensure that all of the values, compressed values that our, that our compression scheme produces, are always going to be fixed length. Right? We talked about this before when we, do, we talked about the DSM. Right? We want to use offsets to figure out where to jump into a column to figure out to find where a tuple is. So we want to make sure if we're compressing our data, we want to make sure that those, we, we, we can always compute that offset very easily because we know that our values are always a fixed length. Right? You don't always get this. Like if you just run again gzip on an you know, arbitrary file, it's going to generate the, you know, whatever, it, you know, it's going to generate some, some, some file with a different size bytes, um, possibly over and over again. Like if you take one file and you, and you compress it, you'll have a certain number of bytes. You use the same algorithm but a different file, it'll have a different number of bytes. Right? So that's, they're not going to be able to do offset jumps if we have this problem. So we make sure all the encoding schemes we, we talk about always generate fixed length values. Uh, and we'll see how we break that and how we get around this when we use naive compression. Uh, so then the other thing we're going to do is we want to make sure that whatever compression scheme we use, we want to allow the database system to postpone for as long as possible in the query plan having to actually decompress the data. So what I mean by that is say I have a, a table with a million tuples and say I just, I just compress every single tuple with, with gzip, some off-the-shelf com general purpose compression algorithm. Now I, if I want to do a sequential scan on that table and find you know, somebody's name where, that, where they equal that value, I have to go through every single tuple and decompress it one by one just to find the thing that I'm looking for. Right? And ideally what I want to be able to do is do my sequential scan using the compressed version of the value, my where clause, so that I don't have to decompress any of the data. So say that particular scan on those 1 million tuples, it only produces 10 tuples in the end. Uh, I only have to do decompression when I have to finally give the result back to the outside world, either to like the other client, the terminal, or whatever machine is executing the query. So if we can delay this as long as possible, we'll get two benefits. One, obviously we're doing less work because we're executing less instructions to, because we're not decompressing things we're never going to have to give back to the client. Uh, we also get the benefit is that we're going to get better cache utilization because now we can operate directly on tuples in their compressed form and we can cram more of them in our CPU caches. So we don't have to do less, we have less page faults, we, less ha we have to go less, or cache meshes, we have to go, go to the DRAM less to get data. Right? So this is going to be really important and we'll see how um, in naive compression you're not always going to be able to do this, but then all the other schemes we'll talk about 
we, we, can, we can try to do this. Um, it goes with also what I was saying, again, this is not, should not be anything new to anybody here, but there's this difference between lossless and lossy compression, right? Uh, a loss, lossless compression scheme would, would guarantee that whatever you compress the data, you know, if you compress the data going in, you get the exact same data coming out. A lossy compression with something like an MP3 or MPEG encoding where you can exploit some aspect of how humans interpret sound or video or, or something to throw away some bits so that when you decompress it, the human can't tell what th whether there's a difference or not. Um, so in our, in our database systems, we're always going to do lossless because the bottom line is people don't like losing data. So I, if I put my data in there in, in this week, I want to come back next week and get back the exact same result. It'd be really bad if some stuff just started missing. So for that purpose, again, we're always going to be talking about lossless compression algorithms. So there are some cases where you do want to do a lossy compression algorithm, uh, but these are always going to be performed at the application level. So what I mean by that is if you want to do lossy comp compression in your database, it's up to you as like the, the application programmer to implement it. The database system is not going to do this for you because it, it doesn't know what's, a, you know what's the right amount, what's the right threshold, or what's the right amount of data you're willing to lose in your application. So an example would be something like this is like say I'm collecting sensor data and my sensors are collecting temperatures every minute uh, and then a year later maybe I don't need that one minute granularity for all that data uh, and maybe when I want to compress it into like five minutes. So you sort of aggregate them together and take the average. You can't go back and get the original data because you've, you've coalesced them into five minute segments instead of one minute segment. But for your application, that might be okay. And so again, the database system has no way of knowing whether that, that was the right thing to do or not. So that's why, again, you're not going to see any uh, lossy compression schemes. You're only going to see lossless. Uh, there are some newer database systems that are out that, exp that support what are called approximate queries. Uh, I and mean, these are sort of like uh, lossy compression algorithms where they're going to give inexact results. Uh, but the difference is that these systems are actually still going to store everything with a lossless compression scheme. Right? So an example of this would be, um, say I'm collecting the number of visitors, I'm keeping track of the number of visitors that, that access my website. Uh, and, I, and I want to say, you know, do a select count star to count the number of unique visitors that occurred you know, last week that visited my website. So in an approximate database system, right, say you have a, a million users, it might do some sampling and return back uh, 999,000 users, right? It's not going to give you an exact number, but for what you actually need it for whatever, you know, to know this count, that's good enough. And so there's a, it was an academic system called BlinkDB that came out of Berkeley a few years ago, and then they since commercialized it as a Snappy Data. So Snappy Data is one of these HTAP systems where they sort of have Gemfire on the front end to do all your OTP stuff, and then they use Spark uh, to execute all the OLAP queries. And then they added this little extra engine to do these approximate queries. Right? So again, it's sort of like a lossy compression scheme, but it's, the data is still actually stored in, the, in its full form. And if you really want to get an exact result, you could always tell it, you know, ignore the approximation stuff, go directly and get the, get the data. So this is an interesting idea, and it's related to this, but we're not going to talk about that this, this semester. All right, uh, so now we can talk about at what granularity the database system can kind of do, can, can try to do compression. Um, and so you sort of think of this as like, what's the, sc what's the scope in which we're going to look at a, a chunk of data in the database and try to compress it? So the, the easiest way to possibly do this is as, at a block level, where you just take a sort of block of tuples that you have in your database, uh, whether it's a page or it doesn't, you know, same thing, and you're just going to do whatever compression you want directly on that, on that block. Um, We'll see an example of what that looks like in MySQL in a second. You can also do compression on a tuple level, where you just take, again, the single contents, the entire contents of a single tuple in, its, in, a, in a row store, and just compress that. And again, you may be thinking, oh, I'm just going to run gzip or snappy on it. Again, we'll see the other encoding schemes. It doesn't necessarily have to be one of those general purpose algorithms. There could be other than these other compression encoding schemes that we're going to talk about later in the lecture. You can do attribute level compression, uh, where you just sort of take a single value or single attribute value in, in the tuple and just compress that. Right, and if you wanted, you could combine multiple attributes if you wanted to, but typically people do it uh, this way here. So this is actually what Postgres does. So if you have a really large blob or text field, Postgres will store this in this auxiliary storage, this variable length storage space called the toast. Um, it stands for something I forget. Uh, but that's basically, they, they can store things as compressed blocks and just have a pointer to where 
that var length, the variable length field is over there. And the last one, again, we'll spend most of our time on this, is doing uh, uh, column or column level compression. And this is where you're going to take all the values for a single attribute uh, across multiple tuples and sort of come up with a compression scheme for them. And you typically only do this in a, in a, in a, in a column store. So, again, there's different trade offs that we'll discuss as we go along about which one's better than another. Uh, so, for example, we talked about how Postgres does attribute level. We'll talk about how uh, you know, HANA and, and Hyper and, and DB2 Blue, they do this column level compression stuff. Uh, my, we'll see how MySQL does block level. Oracle also does block level too, um, but they don't do it for performance reasons. They actually do it for a sort of recovery reasons. So in, um, in Oracle, they have this sort of design philosophy for, for the actual system where they say every block, every page inside the Oracle system has to be self-contained. So they're only going to do compression on a single block because what they don't want to happen is if you do dictionary and compression and you have one page store the actual compressed values and another page store the dictionary, if you trash the dictionary page, if something gets corrupted over there, then you lose that, your, 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 your compressed data. So they have this philosophy where they say everything has to be self-contained so that if there's ever a problem and you actually lose a block, the, 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 the locality of that damage is, is always contained to that single block, which I think is kind of interesting. All right, so we'll keep, we'll, we'll keep this in mind as, as we go along. So another thing that doesn't really fit, uh, I didn't know where to put this in the lecture, but I think it's an interesting idea to sort of keep, keep, keep in the back of your mind as we go along. Just because we're going to have these compressed blocks doesn't mean we're always going to have to access them um, when we execute queries. And whether we can be smart about doing the late materialization or delaying the actual decompression to the very end, uh, there'll be, there's actually a technique we can try to avoid these blocks entirely as well. And these are called zone maps. Um, so the zone map term comes from Oracle. IBM calls them synopsis tables. Uh, Vertica has this. This is a pretty standard technique, but in the literature it's called zone maps. And the basic idea is that we can take our block of data doesn't matter where, whether it's a DSM or NSM, and doesn't matter how this thing's actually compressed. And what we can do is we can pre-compute the zone map that has a bunch of the aggregate calculations already generated for the data in this block. Right? So in this case here, we would know the minimax ahead of time, 100, 400. We have the average sum and count. Right? So think of this as almost like a materialized view on a, on a, on a per block basis. So now if I have a query comes along, say select star from table where value is greater than 600, I could just look in the zone map and see the max value is 400, so I know that there's no tuple in here that's going to have a value that, that's, that's, that's greater than 600, so I don't even have to look at this data, I just can skip it entirely. Right? So zone maps are orthogonal to the compression schemes that we're talking about here, but this shows up in a lot of the literature when they talk about doing a compression on a block basis, uh, they'll talk about putting synopsis or these zone maps sort of in, in an auxiliary data structure to avoid having to do any decompression. All right, so now we talk about naive compression schemes. So this is sort of like, again, one of the big themes about what this lecture is about is, yes, there are off-the-shelf compression algorithms we can use to compress our data, but the database system is going to, if you do that, then the database system is going to have to treat the compressed data as a black box, meaning it doesn't know anything about its contents. And therefore, in order to execute any queries on it, you know, unless you have a zone map, uh, you have to decompress it entirely. And it doesn't matter what granularity you do in this, you just can't infer anything about it because you don't know how the thing was actually compressed. So, the, you can, so these general purpose naive compression algorithms will be sort of all your sort of standard favorite ones. So LZO, LZ4, uh, LZO was sort of the first one and this, this sort of class of compression algorithms. Uh, LZ4 is a newer version. Google came out with Snappy in 2011 and then the new hot one that everyone's using is Z standard from Facebook. So, the, the, again, the way to think about these naive, doing naive compression is it's just a black box. You compress, you, you, you take your bytes in, you get a compressed bytes out. But anytime you want to look at them, you have to decompress them. So we've always got to be mindful of now, again, of like, if we're going to use a general purpose compression scheme, uh, you know, what's the computational overhead of actually doing this? And then there's this trade-off of saying, look, like, how fast are, are they compressed and decompress? So notice here I didn't put like gzip or bzip. Right? People don't typically use those in database systems because those compression algorithms are actually really slow compared to these other ones. So LZO and all these other ones, these are designed to give up better compression ratios in exchange for getting faster compression decompression schemes. Right? So actually if you go to like the Z standard website, 
I should have made this a table in the, in the chart, but that's okay. But they have like this benchmark that shows what's the performance of Z standard versus a bunch of different ones. And what you see is like the compression ratio that Z standard gets is, is much better than these other ones um, compared to like LZO and LZ4, but their speed versus LZO and LZ4 are much slower. So LZ4 is actually really fast, but again, you're giving up better compression uh, in exchange for having fast, faster uh, decompression and, and run times. So I don't think GZIP's not on this, but GZIP would be have much better compression ratio, but actually get worse performance. So again, this is some of the trade-offs that people make when they have to decide what compression algorithm they want to use, and if they're doing naive compression. So I know in the case of like MySQL, or at least in MariaDB, I don't know about MySQL, you can specify when you start the database server, you can specify like which of these compression algorithms you want to use. Um, and again, it depends on what on what you care about, whether they're getting good compression or getting faster performance. Alright, so another thing also to be mindful too about you know, what these general compression algorithms look like. And again, this should not be anything new for anyone who took you know, basic CS courses. There's basically two, two types of compression uh, protocols. There's the entropy coding, where you're going to try to find the more common sequences in your data set, and you want to encode them using the, the fewest number of bits. Uh, this is the same thing as Huffman coding, right? Uh, what is more common and what we'll see as we go along is to use dictionary encoding. So all the LZ algorithms that I showed before, these use some variant of dictionary encoding. And this is the same dictionary encoding that we talked about with the, the SQL Server columnar indexes. We're basically going to build some kind of data structure that's going to map sort of, uh, repeated segments in our data set to smaller uh, identifiers, smaller encoding, encoding values. And then we'll go back to the original data and replace those repeated segments with our with our, with our encoding, right, to reduce the space. Again, this is the same thing we talked about with SQL Server. So let's see how to do this with, um, how to do sort of naive compression in MySQL. So in MySQL, I think 5.5 or maybe 5.7, they added support for doing uh, compression in, in, in ODB. So again, this is a, MySQL is a disk-based system, so we have our in-memory buffer pool, and then we have our on-disk on -disk pages. So when the data is, is, is at rest on disk, it's always going to be stored in, in, in a compressed form. And again, they'll be using one of those, those naive compression algorithms, general purpose compression algorithms to do this. So the size of each of these pages always have to be either 1, 2, 4, or 8. Right? They always have to be sort of a fixed size. Right? And the reason they do this is because it makes it easier to manage uh, you know, how you lay out things on disk if you know you're always going to have pages that, that fit into one of these bucket, size, size buckets. So that means that if, say, you compress your, 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 your page and it comes out being like 1.5 kilobytes, they'll just pad it out so it's always at least two, you know, two kilobytes. Because it always needs to be, you know, whatever the high, take the ceiling of whatever that is to get to one of these values here. So in addition to every compressed page, you have, so you have the compressed data, but then you have this modification log that is, is where there'll be changes that were made by transactions to the data that's in this page. But we actually make some, we can make some changes without having to decompress it first. So think of this as like the, you know, the delta store for an individual page. Like for example, if I know there's a tuple in this, and my query is update table set value equals 5, I don't need to know what the old value was, I'm just always going to overwrite it with that new value 5, so I'll just put it in, in here. If it's update value equals value plus 5, I have, may have to go back and, and decompress it first. Alright, so now what happened is, when the database system, you know, it, it's running, a transaction tries to access a tuple that is not in the buffer pool, but we know it's out in one of these pages, the, we'll go fetch it into our buffer pool. And again, and f any updates that, that can occur where we don't have to read anything, we can always go to the op log. I'm sorry, the mod log. The mod log right? It's basically the same thing as, 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 as an op log. But any time we need to read the data, then we're going to go ahead and we have to uncompress it. And in MySQL, the, the page size, is, when it's uncompressed form, is always going to be 16 kilobytes. All right? So, now what happens is, it always has to keep the compressed version and then the, the, the uncompressed version. And there's nothing about the protocol, what they're doing, that requires them to keep both. I think just for internal bookkeeping, it makes it easier to know that this thing corresponds to this, and then this corresponds to that. Because right, otherwise, if you drop this, and somehow you have to update some internal metadata to know that this thing, when it compresses, should go back over here where I originally got it. Right, so they always keep both around. And what happens is that when you, when you uncompress it, then you, re, then you reapply the op log and, and to, the, to the changes here. 
right? And then when you want to go free it up, then you just recompress it and put it back, and then you can write it back later on. So again, the downside of this is when it's in its compressed form, the database system knows what should be in there, right? Because it, it has the, the, the keeps track of the record IDs that it knows that are inside of it. And depending on what indexes you have, you can then maybe def infer what some of the values are inside of this. But if you ever actually need to look at the, exact, the actual tuple, then you always have to decompress the entire block. Right? Even though, say, say you have 100, 100 tuples inside this one page, you always have to decompress the, all 100 of them, even though you only need to access one of them. Right? And this is because, again, when we're using a naive compression scheme, we don't know anything about what's actually stored inside of this. Right? So, again, this is basically just repeats everything I just said. Right? The data has to be decompressed anytime we have to access it, um, anytime it has to be modified. And this is because we don't, the data system doesn't know anything about the, the, the meaning of what the actual compressed data looks like. So, if we're able to actually do what I said, actually understand what, our, what is actually being stored in its compressed press form, then we're going to be able to do certain queries directly on the compressed data. All right, so say you want to do uh, two joins between some tables, and say you have a columns and they're, they're compressed in the same way. I can just do an exact comparison of those two compressed values in each, in each column, and if they're, if they're equal, as long as they're using the same compression encoding, then I know they'd be equal if they were decompressed. So I don't have to decompress them. Right? This is, this is, this is easy to do for some compression schemes, but if you want to do range predicates, right, it's something less than something, something greater than something, then it becomes more tricky. So the naive compression scheme, you could do this on a per attribute basis and say, I'll, for each value in this, in this table, in this column, I'll compress it with gzip or snappy. And then I'll do the same thing on the other one, and they'll get, they'll get exact matches because it's deterministic, and I can just do st my straight comparison. But I can't do a range query is something less than something because gzip or snappy doesn't enforce that ordering. So we'll see how we can overcome this as we go along. All right, so again, this is sort of the same setup here. The example I was trying to show. Say I do want to query when I say select name equals Andy. I have my database here, and I can put it into its compressed format. And if I want to do exact lookup, I can just compress the term Andy and I can find exactly what I was looking for. Right? So we can do this for most of the compression schemes, even, even the naive ones, but we're not going to be able to do range queries uh, with, with naive compression. We'll see how to get around that. So we're going to spend most of our time for, for in the rest of the lecture talking about how to do columnar compression. So some of these we've already talked about, uh, I think, last class or in the SQL Server col column store, so I'm not going to spend too much time on them. I'm only going to bring them up again because it's going to then we can apply them to other dictionary or other encoding schemes as we, as we go down and actually get even better compression. So what's kind of cool about doing columnar compression for some of these schemes, you actually can apply multiple, you know, use multiple ones together and do even better than you would just using one by itself. So we'll talk about doing null, null suppression, run encoding, bitmap encoding, delta encoding, incremental encoding, mostly encoding from Amazon Redshift, and we'll spend most of our time talking about dictionary encoding. All right, so again, just as to, to ground the discussion in the context of what we talked about before, when we talked about the SQL Server indexes, yes, they were essentially doing some of the same compression encoding schemes we're talking about here, but the difference is that that was on a copy of the data for the indexes. But now we're actually talking about compressing the, the raw underlying base table, right? So that means that in some cases, we, we need to be able to talk about how we can handle doing updates to them, because in that SQL Server paper you guys read, they just froze the table entirely and made the, the, the indexes be read-only. But now as we go along, we'll talk about how can we handle doing updates, because uh, we're actually doing this on, on the base tables. And yes, you know, we can get to this sort of philosophical discussion of what does it mean for a tuple to be actually a tuple. Like, if, in, in the, if we create those columnar indexes and the fractured mirrors, you know, is that really fundamentally different than, than the underlying table if it's stored in the column store, right? And for our purposes, we don't care. We're just talking about how to do this on, on, the, on the, the base tables. All right, so null suppression is more or less this, this thing we talked about when we did the uh, Oracle's BBC uh, encoding for bitmaps. The basic idea is here is that when you have a, a data set where you have consecutive nulls or zeros or blanks, then rather than storing every single exact value, you can store sort of like a, almost like a run-like encoding scheme to say, I had this blank occur this many, many times. Right? 
And this is really useful to do for uh, y, y tables mean with a lot of attributes on sparse data sets. So think of something like uh, if I have a table where I'm collecting all the log messages from my distributed system, a bunch of different services I'm running for my, for my application. Uh, some log, some services will have sort of some attributes in their logs and other ones will have of, of different ones. And so rather than just storing this as just sort of the raw log message, I'm going to parse it and break it up and sort it in a, in a structured format because that's going to make it easier for me to do queries. But now if I have to have support, you know, the logs from my web server, logs from my database server, logs from my, my memcache server, they're not all going to have the same attributes. But I want to combine them into a single table, then I'm going to have a bunch of different attributes that are most of the time going to be null uh, depending on what service is generating the log message. So this is really, you can use null suppression to store sparse data, uh, like this log example, in a small amount of space, right, without having to store the null or zero o over and over again. We also, we talked about run length encoding before, uh, and this basic idea is here is when we have uh, runs of the same value for some long length in our column, instead of storing, again, the exact copy over and over again, we can store this triplet that says, here's the value, here's the starting offset in my column, and here's the number of times it, it's repeated. Right? And as we talked about before, the way to get the best compression ratio for doing run-length encoding is that you want to sort your columns intelligently so that you, you maximize the, the length of the, of the different runs. <laughs> Bitmap encoding we also talked about before, and the idea here is that for every unique value we have in our attribute, we're going to have a separate bitmap that says you know, what tuple at, different, at, at an offset in our column has this value. Uh, and we can only do this when the cardinality is low. And again, this is something that you as the database administrator would have to specify to say, I know that this column can be stored as a bitmap, so go ahead and do that. Right? The database system is not going to come back and tell you, hey, you know, I think you have way many, too, too many attributes. You actually don't want to do a bitmap index. All right, so now we can talk about some new schemes. So we sort of alluded to delta encoding before, but now I actually want to give a specific example because this will show up in, in other parts as, as we go along. So the basic idea with delta encoding is that instead of, again, storing the, the, the exact value in, in a tuple for an attribute over and over and over again, we can actually store the difference of that value from its, from its previous tuple. So let's say in this example here, I have a, a table where I'm keeping track of temperature readings from some sensor. Right? And so every minute, I'm going to take a new reading to say, what's the current temperature of, of the room? So 12 o'clock, I have some time, or I have, have, have a reading, 1201, 1202, and so forth, right? So what we can see is here, what we, and the way delta coding is going to work is that we'll pick the starting point value to be the, the, the you know, in, in, this, in this segment to be the base value. And then we're going to base all of the subsequent values that come after that be dependent on what that base value was. So in this case here, we would start at 12 o'clock, and we'd always have plus one, plus one, plus one, because that's the... That's the delta or difference from the predecessor. So in this case here, it's, you get 1201 by adding one to that. You get 1202 from adding n to this. So there's sort of two ways to do delta encoding. There's this way that I'm showing here, where you, you base it to be based on what the previous value was, or you could base it on what the, the, the first value in your segment would be. So instead of having plus one here, you could have plus two to represent 1202. Um, people typically do it in this way that I'm showing here, because remember in a in an OLAP system, where you, where, you know, where you actually want to use a column store, you don't care about finding exact tuples, right? You care about computing some aggregate across a large segment of tuples. So it doesn't matter that, you know, in order to get this, off, this exact value here, that I have to go scan from the beginning and add one, you know, as I go down and keep track of what, the, you know, the, what my running total is in order to get to this point here. That's okay, because I'm going to be doing that scan anyway. If I care about doing point queries, then even if I care about doing point queries, it doesn't matter. You always have to scan through anyway. So, so this compression scheme, even though it's slow to do point queries, this is good for the OLAP stuff we want to do. And we're doing the same thing here for the, for, for the temperatures, right? We're, at, we're having a, a, a delta from what the previous one was. So now, this is a great example where you actually combine compression schemes to get even better results. Right? So we notice here, we're saying plus one, plus one, plus one over and over again because we're just you know, taking a new measurement every single, every single minute. So we actually can then also use run length encoding to now say we have plus one four times. So first we do the delta encoding. We, we recognize that we have these repeated values. Then we come back and do the run length encoding. So this is an example of like where you combine these different encoding schemes together and get, and get better compression ratios. <coughs> 
Right, is that sort of clear what's going on? Right, we'll, see, we'll see this occur uh, later on when we talk about dictionary encoding. Another technique we can use uh, that's sort of similar to delta encoding is called incremental encoding or prefix encoding. And the basic idea here is that we're going to store just the, the difference of a attribute value from its, from its predecessor. Right? And we'll keep track of what, how much of the prefix we can use from the previous guy. So in this case here, I, I have four tuples, robbed, rob, rob, robbed, robbing, and ro robot. And so what we'll first do is we want to figure out what's the common prefix from each tuple to the previous one. Right? So in the case, this, this is our first one, so we don't have a prefix, right? Because there's nothing above it. In the case of, of robbed, we would see that we have ROB is, is shared with the, pr the, the previous one. So we would store that. Same thing for the next one, we go down the line, we have ROBB and then ROB. And now the way we actually would store this is in our compressed version, we would have, a, for each tuple, we'd have a pair. So the first thing would be the prefix suffix that says, what portion of the previous value can I reuse? And then the suffix is the remaining attributes that are actually unique from, the, from its predecessor. So in this case, the first one for Rob, it doesn't have a predecessor, so its prefix length is zero. In this case here, for the second guy, I, my prefix length is three, because I can use ROB from the, from the previous one, and then I have BED that comes afterwards, because this is the unique suffix that, that the other guy didn't share with it. All right, I can just do this down the line. And again, the same thing as before, yes, I can't do point queries very easily, because in order to figure out what's the exact value of this attribute here, or the, for this tuple here, for this attribute, I have to decompress the entire thing, but that's okay in OLAP queries because I'm doing you know, large central scans that are going to have to read all the data anyway. Okay? Um, yes? This would be more compact if it was um, arranged in alphabetical order. Yes, yeah, so, so her question is, would this be more compact if this is arranged in alphabetical or sorted order? At, yes, Th sorry, this ha it only works if you're doing it in sorted order, right? And we'll see when we do dictionary encoding, the, the inner leaves where they, where they do their mapping, they are going to be sorted because that's how we're going to do order preserving dictionaries. Right? So in this example here, again, this is sort of like run length encoding. If you pre-sort the data intelligently, then you get the best compression ratio for this. Okay. Um, so this next scheme is called mostly encoding. It's not really a compression scheme. It's sort of like a... a, like a Oh, duh, this is actually a good idea. All right, this is pretty easy to do. And this actually comes from Amazon Redshift. And the basic idea is that the, the data system can recognize when you declare that the size of an attribute is actually larger than most of the values you're actually storing in it. All right, so let's say that you, do, you have a table and you declare some column to be a 64-bit integer, but for most of the values you're storing in that column, they don't need the full 64 bits. Right, in this case here, I have 2, 4, 999 million, and then 6 and 8. So only this attribute here does actually need the full 64 bits. All these other ones can be stored in a smaller data type. So I'll, I'll declare my colony be mostly 8, meaning most of the integers I'm going to store can be represented in 8 bits. And then I'll have a little special marker that says, if, if, for, if you have this marker here, it says that the value for this tuple is not stored in this column, there's instead a separate lookup table where you say, for this offset that I was, what's actually the real value that I had? Right? Because so, again, most of the time, you're going to be fine with 8 bits, but for the few cases where you're not, then you can store it in this auxiliary table. So obviously, if you, uh, if you get this wrong, right, if most of your attributes are not, cannot be stored in 8 bits, then this is going to be really slow because every single time you, you, you start reading this, you have to do an, an, another lookup in this other table here. Right? But for a lot of cases, maybe th this is okay. Right? And again, this is, this is actually a, a pretty big win, right? In this case here, right, I went from 64 bits to 8 bits right, for, for, for these attributes. Right? That's an 8x reduction. That's, that's a lot. Um, and I think the way it works in Redshift is you have to declare this ahead of time as the administrator. Right? I, it doesn't figure this out for you automatically. But there's no reason that it actually couldn't. I just like this because it's sort of, cl it's, again, it's so simple that it's like, why doesn't everybody do this? All right, so now we can get to the, to the main thing or the, uh, that we want to talk about today that you guys read, and this is how to do dictionary compression. Um, and as we talked about before, the basic idea is that when we have frequent patterns of, 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 of values in our columns, 
we're going to represent them with smaller codes. And for our purposes, we're just going to focus on uh, you know, variable length fields or, or character fields. You could also do this with, with integers. Right? If you, instead of storing things as 64 bit integers, if you had a small enough uh, domain, you can maybe store this as 8 bit dictionary values. But for our purposes here, we'll just talk about this in the context of, of strings. So this is the most common or most pervasive compression scheme used in every single database system. Right? If it, with the exception of like, you know, the MySQL block level compression that I talked about before, uh, if you have an OLAP database and they're doing compression, they're probably doing uh, dictionary compression. It's pretty much in everything. Because right? it has the nice support where you can do fast encoding and decoding, you can support range queries, and you can delay materialization until the very, very end. And you can operate directly on, on compressed values. So, the questions we're going to ask at, to, to answer as we go along is, we need, understand, we need to understand when do we actually want to construct our dictionary, um, and what's the scope of that dictionary, like so for how, what elements of the database can, be, can share the same dictionary, uh, how are we going to allow for, for range queries, and how are we going to enable for fast encoding and decoding. So the, as we go along, these are the answers we're, we're going to try to solve. All right, so for the first one, do you, when do we actually want to construct the dictionary, there's basically two ways to do this. So you could uh, just compute a dictionary for all the tuples that you have, whatever the scope it, you, you're going you're, you're to use for your dictionary, you just compute the dictionary when all the data is just first entered in the system. And then any time that you have new tuples come along, you're going to use a separate dictionary for them, because uh, so, you don't want uh, uh, you don't, you don't, you don't to sort of um, invalidate the previous dictionary that, that you've already generated. So let's say I have my database is on disk, right, some, some CSV files. When I bulk load it into the system, I'll compute the dictionary for that, for that data I just loaded. Then if I have any updates or inserts that come along later, I'll maintain a separate dictionary for them. So this is the technique that, uh, that uh, db2blue does, this is what HANA does, uh, I think this is what memsql does as well, right? Because uh, you don't want to have to modify the, the, the previous dictionary that, that you've already generated. The other approach is to do this incrementally, where you're going to allow new tuples or new updates that come along to modify a previous dictionary. Right? And in order to make this work, you have to be careful about how you encode your, your values so that you can allow for in, new values to be inserted without having to re-encode everyone else. Right? So if I densely pack my encoding scheme, like so, so if I have, you know, I say I have four attributes and their, their encoding values are one, two, three, four. But then I insert a new value that comes between 3 and 4. Then I need to go back and, and modify all the tuples that re used to have 4 because now they're going to have 5. So typically the way you get around this is you have a little bit of extra uh, slack space in between each different values so that you can insert one without having to disrupt everything else. Right? But of course at some point this is going to get too, you, you know, you're going to run out of space and you have to re-encode everything. So I don't know who actually d does this. I mean, in the paper you guys read, they do some, sort of something like this. Um, the way they, 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 they're careful about it, they, they lock the entire dictionary any single time they, um, they want to update it because they have to go around and re recode everything. All right, now we talk about what's the scope of our, of our dictionary. Um, so we talk, this is sort of similar to what we talked in the beginning of like what's the, for our, our compression scheme, what are we actually compressing? And so our scope could be on a single block where we're going to build a single dictionary for all the tuples that are contained in that table within that, within that block. Right? You're going to get worse compression because now you have, uh, if you have a new dictionary for every single block, you're going to have repeated values in, on all these different dictionaries. Right? But again, what the advantage of this one is it can make it really easy for us to do incremental updates or even if you have to do complete re-encodings, you only have to access tuples that are in that block. You don't have to scan the entire table. And again, we talked about how Oracle does this because they want to minimize the damage that can occur if you corrupt, your, your, you know, if you corrupt your, your, a page or a block. Table level compression would be just constructing a dictionary for the entire page. And again, this is going to give us better compression ratio because we'll have more repeated values, but it's going to be more expensive to update. And then the last technique is to do multi-table dictionaries. And the way to think about this is, say I have two tables where one table has a foreign key relationship with the other table. So I could reuse the same dictionary for those two tables because I know that the values that either the two columns are going to have have to be in the same domain. Because right? there's no value that could be in the, in the child of the foreign key relationship that would not appear in the, in the parent because that violates the integrity of, of a foreign key or the referential integrity 
So I can use a single dictionary for both of them and not have to maintain these two separate data structures. Right? And this makes it really fast to do joins or, or set operations like intersections and unions because, again, the domains are going to be exactly the same. If you don't have this and your encoding scheme ends up being different, uh, when you do, want to do a foreign key lookup, say I have, you know, I want to do a lookup on, and the value I'm doing my lookup in the parent table gets mapped to the dictionary code 1234. But because I have another dictionary for the, the child table, it's going to get mapped to 546 you know, or 456. In order for me to do the join directly in compressed data, I have to decompress the, the, the child attribute first, then recompress it using the dictionary from the parent table. Then I can do my lookup. So if you can share it across multiple tables, then you can avoid this problem here. So, the, again, the different database systems do different things. Usually it's somewhere in between, right? So STP, HANA, and, and MemSQL, I think they do something in between these two where it's not on a single block, but it'll sort of be in, in multiple blocks. So you could do something like, again, STP, HANA, what happens is you have that delta store where you put all your new inserts updates in, in, into a row store format. And then when you want to convert it to a column store format, then you take a large chunk of that delta store and then you'll convert it to the column store and then you compress that. So that delta store could, could be multiple blocks and so your dictionary would span all those blocks. So typically, sometimes you see it in somewhere in between these. It's not the full table, but it's not on an individual block. And I actually think that's the, sort of the best of both worlds. All right, so another cool thing you can do with dictionary encoding is you have al multiple attribute encoding. Uh, and the idea here is that instead of storing a single value in, in your dictionary per attribute, uh, you can actually have the dictionary uh, encoding encompass multiple values. Right, and this, this is related to what we talked about in the beginning, where we, if we know our values are correlated, then we know that they're going to be repeated. Uh, the the, the you know, two, one, two or more attributes are going to have the same values multiple times. So in this case here, in my original table, I have value one with, with the domain being ABC, ABC. And then in the value two, anytime I have A, it's going to be always 202. Anytime I have B, it's going to be always 101. Right? Think of this again, like if you have the, the state and the zip code. The, if you know the zip code, you always know the state. So what we can do is, in our dictionary, we can instead of storing a separate dictionary for each of these, we'll say our dictionary has, for both value one and value two, we'll generate a single code. And now in our combined column, we only store just that one code, right? So now to do this lookup, it's, it's super fast because we're only having to do one probe and one dictionary to find the thing we're looking for. So you see this all the time. We read the literature about column stores and compression. Uh, but as far as I know, no database system actually does this because, because again, it's, it's hard for the database system to auto automatically figure out that two values are always going to be correlated. Right, just because it just sees the data that it currently has and looks very correlated, it doesn't know that you're going to insert something later on that breaks that assumption. So that's why most, most, no system actually, actually does this, even though you can get, for some cases you can get a big win on this. All right, now we need to talk about how we, we can encode and decode the data. Um, all right, so the, the basic idea is, again, encoding would take an uncompressed value and convert it to its, its dictionary encoding form, and then decoding is just the reverse of this. So the thing to be mindful of is that there's, there's not going to be a magic hash function we can use to do this for us, right? Because if you use something like MD5 or SHA-1 or SHA-256, these are one-way hashes, meaning I can do the encoding, but I can't do the reverse. So you can use a cryptographic function to, to get this property, but the problem is, one, that's going to be super slow, and two, it's not going to guarantee that you have fixed-length uh, values. Right? So instead, we're going to we're have to maintain two different data structures to do this both encoding and decoding for us. Right? And the key thing in order to support range queries is we want this to be order preserving. So what I mean by that is we want the order of the lexicographical order of the values that we're going to use for, to encode our, 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 the encoded values for our original data to represent the same sort order of the original data. So let's say I have a table here and I have four, four values, Andrea, Joy, D Andy, and Dana. And so when I generate my uh, dictionary encoding scheme, the Andrea is, is, is the smallest value, so it's going to have the smallest dictionary encoding. Andy comes next, he has the next biggest one, and so forth. Right? And so then now what's going to happen is if I have a query that wants to do a, uh, a lookup like this, so select star from users where name, like, 
A and D, and then a wild card. I can actually convert this into a between query because what, I'll, what the optimizer will do is it will recognize that I have this dictionary that I can with all these values in it. It can do the scan on this or binary search to find the the tuples or sorry, find the values that match my where clause, figure out what their what their codes are, and then do a, you know rewrite the query to be like this. So then I do what can do my sequential scan and I evaluate this predicate looking directly on the compressed values. Right, so this is, another, this is another key example of why letting the data system manage compression itself instead of using a naive compression scheme is always going to be better because internally LZO and LZ4 and snapping all these different algorithms they're basically doing dictionary encoding but this dictionary table is not exposed to the database system it doesn't know anything about it but because we're going to maintain this ourselves we can actually process some of the queries only having to look at, at the dictionary and never actually having to look at the raw data. Uh, you can sort of think of this as like, it's, in like, a, it's like a, basically another index, right? So let's look at another example. So say I have a query when I'm going to do select name from users where name like A and D with a wild card, right? So the question is here, we know we're always going to have to do a lookup into the, the dictionary to figure out what are the codes we want to we look for here, right? But now because I'm not doing select star, I'm doing a select name, it may be the case that I don't even have to look at the other columns in my table. Right? For this example here, I actually do have to do my lookup because the, there's no information in my dictionary as, as to the number of tuples that have each of these values. Right? It just has a coding. It doesn't tell you the frequency of them. So for this one, I still have to do my lookup in my dictionary table, then do my sequential scan in the regular table. But if I had a distinct clause here, all I need to do is just find my matches in the dictionary and I never need to look at the original data. Right? And you can't do this when you have naive compression because you don't have access to the, the dictionary table here. All right? Same kind of thing. If you have like a select count, select distinct, uh, or select, select count distinct, you could just count the number of unique uh, names you have directly on the dictionary without having to look at the original data. Right? So that's, that's a big win. That's, that's, that's why dictionary encoding, if you, if you preserve the order, uh, helps you out. Yes? Uh, for, the, for the first query, yes. couldn't you get around to doing a sequential scan by, by looking at the, at the dictionary and finding that Andrea and Andy are the two fits, and then are the only two possible fits, and then, doing, then converting that to basically two equality queries, and then maybe using the index? So his question is, if, if I do my lookup for the first query here, I recognize that Andrea and Andy are the only two matches, and you're saying do what? Then do like basically convert that query into two equality matches, where name equals Andrea or name equals Andy, and then these indexes. Okay, so his statement is, I convert this qu one query into two separate queries that are doing does something equals something. Yeah. Uh, or actually, even, it's, it could still be one query where something equals something or something equals something, right? Uh, then have another index to do a lookup to find just those one tuples. Yeah. Right. So for this, I'm assuming there are no additional indexes. Right. We're just always doing a sequential scan on this. Yes. Um, right, if you had a, uh, th again, there's nothing. Again, this is what I was trying to say before that this is independent of the indexes you have. And yes, if you had those indexes, you, you could you could do the same thing. You speed that up. But if you had to do a direct sequential scan again, like. Another big benefit of this is instead of having to do, you know, does string equal string, I'm in, in the, this case here, when I'm doing my between, I'm just doing comparisons between integers, and that's super fast. And if I'm doing sequential scan on this, then I can use SIMD to, to vectorize the execution, and that's going to be even faster. Right? So again, there's another benefit is like not only is the size of the data going to be smaller because we're storing it now with integers instead of strings, doing comparison of them is going to be way faster too. Another, so the only one downside about this is that if the wild card is not at the end, if it's either at the beginning or the middle, you have to do more work to do more uh, sequential scan inside the actual dictionary itself. Right? When it's at the end, you can just sort of do a binary search and find exactly the thing, things that you're looking for. Uh, when it's somewhere else, then you may have to do a sequential scan across the entire thing. And then instead of converting it into a between, you convert it to an in clause. Right? Okay. All right, so how do we actually want to implement our dictionary? So 
you know, one way obviously would be to use a hash table, right? They're nice because they're, they're fast, they're compact, we do O1 lookups. But again, it's the same problem we talked about in the beginning is that you're not going to be able to do range, range queries easily on these and it's going to be hard to do sort of the prefix, uh, prefix like queries that we talked about before. Um, the, so the obvious choice is to use an order preserving tree, like a B plus tree, a skip list, a BW tree, it doesn't matter. The downside obviously of course is that this is going to be slower than a hash table and it's going to take more memory, but we'll be able to support the range of previous queries that, that we care about. So in the paper you guys read, uh, it's, it's, it uses an interesting idea where they're going to use two B plus trees uh, for the encoding and decoding. And instead of maintaining sort of the, the different leaves with the mapping of a, of a value to the dictionary code, they're actually going to share the leaves, right? which I think is actually really novel. So you sort of think of this as like there's two indexes going in two different directions and they, then they meet up in the middle when the shared leaves. Right? So the leaves are going to be these sorted uh, mappings from the value to the code. Uh, and that way, regardless of whether you're going from the, from, the, from the top down or the bottom up, you can always do a sort of binary search that quickly to find what you're looking for. Actually, if you're doing decoding, you have to do a linear search. If you're doing encoding, you can do binary search. But the page is not going to be that really that big, right? So it's not going to be uh, super expensive to do, do that lookup if you, if you have to do a linear search. All right, so the way this works is the encoding index allows you to take the original value in, you traverse down to find the, the leaf nodes, and then you spit out what the encoded value is. And then likewise, for the, uh, the, if you have the encoded value, you go in the other direction, do a linear search, and then you come back out with the, what the original value would be. Right? So the thing to point out, though, is, again, I sort of mentioned this before, notice here I'm saying that I have the, the encoded values are 10, 20, and 30, 40. So that way, if I insert a new value that comes between 10 and 20, say, like, you know, I map it to 15, I can insert that store the tuple with the new encoded value and not have to update anything else. If I run out of space between 10 and 20, then I have to readjust everything. And that means basically doing a sequential scan across the entire data set and re-encoding everything. But this is why I talked about before, if you have a sort of smaller granulator scope of what the dictionary is, is supporting, like on a single block or a, or a subset of the table, then you, d you may not have to do this update and re-encode all, all over and over again because the, once the, sort of that segment gets full, you don't try to insert new things into it. Right? So again, think of the Delta store example. If once things get cold from the, from the row store and I'm going to migrate to the column store, when it gets cold and, and it's in the column store, it's probably never going to be updated again. So I'll, I'll build my dictionary once and that's pretty much the end of it. Right? Whereas if I had a dictionary for the entire table, then every single time I, I kept inserting new tuples, I may have to do this entire re-encoding. Re the other thing about this is that, so she sort of brought up before, is that these values are sorted based on the, uh, on the values. So, and, in, and if we're doing strings, then we're going to have probably a lot of prefixes that are similar. So we can actually do additional compression inside of the shared leaves using the incremental prefix encoding that we talked about before to get even now even a better compression ratio for these guys. Right, again, we can daisy chain these compression schemes together to do better than we would just by themselves. Okay, so that's sort of it for doing uh, OLAP compression. And as I said, the dictionary encoding scheme is, is, is the most widely used approach. Um, and I really get into how di different systems do different things. Like DB2 does it differently than, than HANA. These guys, I don't think the paper you guys read is actually implemented in any system, but I do like, I had you guys read it because it sort of lays out all the problems of dictionary encoding and they had to talk about how to do updates in both directions, which I think is kind of cool. All right, but now everything I talked about here so far is not actually what you want to do if you want to get fast transaction processing workloads or do compression in fast OLTP databases. The naive compression scheme that I talked about at the beginning for doing the block-based compression in MySQL, you know, that's what MySQL does. Uh, Wire Tiger does this for, for MongoDB. That's, you know, that's, that's good enough for general purpose workloads. But if you, if you want to do fast in-memory transactions, then you don't want to do something like this. And then typically you don't actually want to compress the data because now when you want to, want to access a tuple, you have to decompress it. And that's going to take time. You, 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 have, you spend cycles doing that. And again, we talked about before, when you want to do a transaction, you want it to finish as quickly as possible because you're holding locks and latches while you're doing operations. So if you delay the time it takes to actually complete the transaction, then you're slowing everybody down. So in our research, we were looking at, well, what are the other things we can compress 
in, in, in an OLTP database that's not the data to reduce the, the memory footprint of, of our database in memory. All right, and it turns out for a lot of OTP databases, it's actually the indexes that are, are the biggest thing. Right, so th we did a study um, using HDOR, which, which is the, again, the, the academic version of OLTP, the database system I helped build uh, when I was in grad school. And we loaded three sort of standard OLTP benchmarks and we measured what percentage of the database or memory usage was spent in the actual database versus the indexes. Right? And so what you see is that for these workloads, in case of TPCC, 57% of the total memory usage is just spent on the indexes. 54% right? for voter, and this, this, this article's benchmark is supposed to model like Reddit or Hacker News, where you, sort of people post articles and comments. Right? So you have larger text attributes, uh, so that's why the index isn't as big. But this is actually really common in OTB databases because people want, need their transactions to run really fast, so they usually build a lot of indexes to speed everything up because you never want to do a sequential scan inside of an OTB database. So if we know that we, can't, we don't want to compress the tuples because that would be slow, we want to figure out a way to try to actually compress maybe the indexes. And, and so the approach we came out with was a technique called hybrid indexes. And the basic idea is sort of similar to the delta store approach we talked about last class where you have sort of the, the, the fast dynamic part for all the new data coming in and then you have a compressed or a compact version as the back end for cold data that's not being updated. Again, we're still talking in the context of, of an OTB database. And so when I say cold data, I mean maybe it's data that's just read, uh, but it's never actually updated. Right, and, it's, and it's read in the context of transactions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have basically a, a dual stage index. We'll have, in the front part, we'll have a dynamic stage where this will be fast for us to update and this is where we're, we're gonna put all our new information. And then over time, we'll migrate cold data to this backend static stage, which is we'll use a com compact index that's be much smaller in size than, than the dynamic stage, but still be just as fast. All right, so again, all the updates are going to be go to the dynamic side, and then anytime we want to do a read, depending on what the query is and what kind of index it is, we may have to check both stages. All right, so this sort of the high-level diagram looks like this. So again, we have our dynamic stage for that. For that and this could be any index you want. It could be a skip list, it could be plus tree, BW tree, an art index, doesn't matter. And then the same thing for on the static side, this will be a compressed version of one of those standard tree, tree indexes that we talked about before. So again, all our insert update deletes always go to the dynamic side. Uh, and then over time, and when it gets too big, we'll just merge all the, the, the contents over to the static index. We have a way to rebuild this uh, on, on, uh, over and over again. Then when I want to do a read, I'm going to have a balloon filter in front of the dynamic index that can give, tell me whether it thinks the thing I'm looking for is in there or not. Remember, bloom filters will give you false positives, will never give you false negatives. So if it gives us a false positive and we do our read down here, if it's not there, then, then we know we always need to go check the static side. But if it tells us no, it's not there, then we have to go check on the static side and do our read there. So again, this is, think of this as being done at the data structure level that you guys are building for your skip list. There's the sort of single logical index interface that the database system uses. It doesn't know, it doesn't care that there's a dynamic side and a static side. It just knows it has a single API to make calls into the index and get the values that it's looking for. So the one tricky thing about hybrid indexes are when you want to do range scans, when you, when you want to do an iteration, because now you need to have two concurrent iterators at the same time in both of these and then walk through them uh, you know, in lockstep because right? you want to avoid having false positive or false negatives. All right, so let me show you actually how you, you compress an index. Right? So this is sort of a standard B plus tree, right? We have uh, you know, we have, we have pointers to everything, and then because the protocol specifies that we only have to uh, do a merge when the, one of these nodes is less than half full, in this case here, we just have a bunch of empty space because we're expecting new stuff to come in. But because we, this is on the static side and it's a read-only index, we know we're not going to have to insert new stuff in, so we actually want to get rid of these, all these empty spaces here. And we can then collapse it into a more compressed form. Right, typically, I think the studies show that like a B plus tree, on average, uh, the nodes are like 69, 60 to 69% actually full. So that means that we have about 40% of the data of, of, of memory being used by B plus tree is completely empty. Right, so we can just get rid of all that entirely because we know our index is going to be static. So the next thing we can now get rid of is all the, these pointers. And again, we have these pointers because we're assuming that B plus tree is meant to be a dynamic index. So that means that we can do splits and merges and move these blocks around and we, we want to update our pointers to go find them. But again, because we know we're read-only, 
we don't actually need them and instead we always we just used uh, fixed offset to know how to jump from uh, some position in a giant array to get to the values that we're looking for. And we don't need to keep track of our sibling pointers anymore because if I want to do a leaf node scan you know, across the bottom, then I just scan this, this array. Right? So this is how we're going to get better compression in our static indexes. And this is a, a quick, uh, some benchmarks that we did to show the, the performance benefit and the, the, the memory benefit, memory reduction you get from this. So this is using the SDX B plus tree, which is probably the, the best state of the art open source B plus tree implementation. Uh, but it's, it's single threaded, it's not a concurrent index. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have our workload, we're doing 50% reads and 50% writes using different data types. So one, we have random 64-bit integers, they have monotonically increasing 64-bit integers, think of this as like an auto increment key. And then we have our email, this is actually uh, a real data set from the Ashley Madison uh, website data that, that got released about two years ago. All right, so across the board you see that the hybrid index having the dual stages actually gets better performance because the size of the dynamic index is actually really small because we're always merging stuff to, to the, to the read-only index and therefore more we can fit in our CPU caches. All right? But then even, even, even though we're still getting better performance, we're actually using less memory too, right? Because we're storing most of the data in the static read-only compressed compact index in, in, the, in the second stage. So again, this is awesome because not only are we getting faster, we're actually using less memory. Which is, you know, which is totally what you, you, know, what you would absolutely would want in an in-memory OLTP index or a database, right? So in the paper, again, we're not going to read that, but we talk about how to apply these techniques to do this compression for any possible trio of data structures you have. So we can do this on a skip list, we can do this on art index, we can do this on a mass tree. We didn't apply it to the BW tree, but I think it would, it would work there as well, right? And it just sort of shows you how you, you can apply this for any possible index and, and use this inside of OLTP database. So we did this in, in HStore uh, and w the, the goal maybe this semester is to support this, this technique over into Peloton. Alright, so what are my parting thoughts on this? As, as I said, I think dictionary encoding is probably, it is the most widely used compression scheme and it's super handy because you don't have to do any pre-sorting or pre-organization of the data as you would in maybe run length encoding and all these other schemes. You just stick the data in and you get great compression. Um, we also showed how you can apply different approaches one after another to get better compression you would than using by themselves. And then we also showed how it's always important to wait as long as possible when you're executing a query to actually go find, find decompress the data. Because if you, if you don't do this, and you're essentially just going to be wasting cycles. So currently in Peloton we don't do any, compre we don't do any compression. Uh, I think it would be an awesome project three in this class if someone does uh, dictionary compression. Right, and whether you actually do the, the scheme that, that presented in the paper or the other schemes from HANA and DB2Blue that we can talk about, I think this would be an awesome project. Right, and it, it fit nicely with everything we talked about in this course. Alright, so for next class on Tuesday next week, actually no, today's Tuesday, so it's Thursday, sorry. Uh, we will talk about how to do uh, logging now. So now we're going to talk about how do we actually make sure that if we have an in-memory database and we apply changes to it, if someone comes along and pulls the plug, we don't lose everything. So we'll talk about how to do this in physical logging or physiological logging, which is the most common technique. But then we'll show the benefits of doing uh, logical logging, which is what VoltDB does. Okay? Any questions? Okay, awesome guys. See you on Thursday. <laughs>